Good day, my dear students. Um, this is to welcome you to uh, this uh, interaction in respect of um, ACC 111. In the last interaction, we were able to define what accounting is, explain the nature and scope of accounting. We also discuss the various uh, roles accountants actually play in uh, any uh, economy. Uh, today, in this interaction, we're focusing on other aspects. Uh, remember, I told us that in our next discussion, we're looking at uh, the principles underlining accounting and practice. Uh, what are those uh, principles that explain how we record transactions, uh, how accounting practice has been uh, carried out. These principles are classified into what we call concepts and uh, conventions. So our interaction today will cover these uh, aspects. First, uh, it is important that we know that accounting practice is governed by a number of principles and um, we, we, we call them com concepts and uh, conventions. These principles are very, very fundamental in the practice of accounting such that the application has become a necessity, i.e. it's something that definitely accountants must uh, apply such uh, principles. They have been so accepted and are issued in the form of uh, standards by the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB, at the international level, and the Financial uh, Reporting Council of Nigeria, formerly known as uh, Nigeria Accounting Standards Board uh, in, in Nigeria. It is important that we, we, we at this point, mention that Nigeria has actually keyed into the adoption of international financial reporting standards as released by International Accounting Standards and Board. As we progress, we'll come across um, these uh, standards um, um, uh, as the class uh, progress. First, we also need to acknowledge the fact that these rules, um, that, that, that these are rules for concepts. Let us identify concepts first that concepts are more or less the rules that are adopted by the accounting profession as guides in measuring, recording, and reporting the financial affairs and activities of a business uh, concern to the various, to its owners and other interested uh, parties. These rules are developed on the basis of uh, experiences of accountants, on the basis of reasons, or on the basis of customs, usage, and particular uh, necessities. In essence, the sources for these um, uh, principles are basically experience, reasons, customs, usage, and practical necessity. The first concept we'll be looking at is um, the entity concept. Uh, here, the assumption is that accounting measures the results of the operations of, of specific entities which are separate and distinct from owners of uh, such uh, entities. The understanding we have here is that, or the message that is being passed across here is that we strongly believe that account uh, a business concern is different from the owners of uh, that uh, business. This concept holds that every economic unit, i.e. every business organization, regardless of its legal form of existence, is treated as a separate entity in accounting different from parties that have proprietary or economic uh, interests in it. By proprietary interests, we are referring to having a shareholding, being part of the owners of uh, such a um, 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 business uh, entity. By economic interest, it could be that you are a creditor to such an organization and because of that, uh, we, we strongly believe that I will work with the assumption that uh, the business unit is different from these uh, parties and is treated in such an uh, uh, order. In the case of limited liability companies, the law made the distinction. Uh, it is so clear in that companies are regarded as separate legal entities different from shareholders or directors of uh, such uh, companies. In the case of uh, partnerships and sole proprietorship, the, dis the distinction is less glaring. 
in the sense that the, the, the line is very thin it is a bit uh, difficult for you to separate between the owner and uh, the business but even at that the books of account of such businesses are normally kept separately to maintain that distinction therefore we in accounting keep the assets liabilities expenses income and business activities of a business concern different from that of uh, the owners of um, the, the business the next concept is uh, the historical cost uh, concept and this concept holds that cost is the appropriate basis for initial accounting recognition of all assets acquisitions services rendered or received expenses incurred creditors and owners uh, interest in a business uh, organization and it also holds that subsequent to acquisition cost values are retained throughout the accounting uh, process the focus here is that for the purpose of recording transactions it is the cost of the transaction not any other value that is supposed to be recognized in the books of account and if it is an asset that you are you acquired uh, after acquisition of the asset it is the value of the asset so acquired that should be reflected in the books of account year in year out the emphasis of this concept is mostly on asset um, recognition in books of um, uh, account the wisdom behind using the historical cost is that of all the values that can be assigned to an asset for instance market value realizable value liquidation value only historical value has documentary evidence in the form of uh, receipts it is important to note that this concept only works when the going concern concept is in application we'll look at what going concern concept is uh, in the subsequent 10 slides where a business is about to be sold or is undergoing what we we'll call liquidation we'll, the, 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 the application of uh, historical cost is suspended and in place of that, uh, we use estimated sales value or liquidation value uh, to report uh, the value of such an uh, asset under such circumstances. But aside that, if a business enjoys going concern status, it is historical cost that the assets of that business concern must be reported. We just mentioned going concern. Here, we'll uh, explain what it means. Going concern is a principle that assumes that the business unit will operate in, perpe in perpetuity meaning it will operate into an indefinite period of time long enough to be able to achieve its objectives that is the business is not expected to be liquidated in the foreseeable uh, future now what what is our condition that makes uh, a business have a status of a going concern we say that a business is, is considered a going concern if it is capable of earning a reasonable net income and there is no intention or threat from any source to curtail significantly its line of uh, business in the foreseeable future meaning there should be sustainability in place meaning the business should be earning good profit such that sustainability can be guaranteed except uh, where that happens we cannot see that the business has a going concern as that. So in essence, the idea behind going concern is to say that records are being kept such that we, we believe that the business will continue into uh, an indefinite uh, period of uh, uh, time, except where there are uh, issues with the ability of the business to earn reasonable net income. And of course, whether there are threats that will curtail the line of uh, business of such a business entity in the foreseeable uh, future. Next is a periodicity concept. This con on the basis of this uh, concept, uh, we believe that the life of a business is uh, divided into appropriate periods for the purpose of determining its results of uh, operations. Uh, although the results of a business unit cannot be determined with precision until its final liquidation, the business community and users of financial statements require that the business be divided into what we call bookkeeping periods or accounting periods. 
this accounting period or bookkeeping period runs for one year i.e. 12 months and that that changes in position be measured over these um, uh, 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 periods uh, let me draw attention to the fact that uh, if a business enjoys a uh, going constant status meaning a business is expected to continue into an indefinite period of time uh, agreed but for us to understand that the business is actually uh, making profit uh, and has ability to continue into an indefinite period of time we definitely will have a period within which we can assess to confirm that and that period is normally one accounting year or a bookkeeping uh, uh, period which is normally uh, one, one year and this one year basically covers uh, 12 uh, calendar calendar months it can start from january and end in december it, it, it can start in uh, february and end uh, in um, in um, uh, march of the subsequent uh, year as the case may be what is important is that there must be a 12 month period this is called a normal uh, uh, period there are conditions that businesses may not be able to meet up with this uh, normal period for instance if a business is commencing it may likely not have the 12 month uh, period especially for the first year of a uh, commencement for instance if a business starts in march and it it it, it makes makes up its accounting year and uh, probably in july from march to july you're likely going to have a 12 a 12 months if there is a change in accounting date i.e the accounting year end of a business uh, uh, an ongoing business uh, has been changed because businesses are at liberty to have that in place provided the resolution has been made at AGM so if there is a change in accounting uh, date of course the normal period of uh, 12 months may not that be available in some situations you, you may have more than uh, 12 uh, months and then if a business is liquidating you are likely going to have at the 12 month period between the time the business has its last accounting year and when it is going to uh, liquidate for instance if the accounting year end of a particular business is december and by june the subsequent year the business uh, could not survive it means it will undergo liquidation by that uh, uh, period in which case you have less than one year so these are conditions uh, for which you are likely not going to have this um, normal accounting uh, period which is which are a, a bit uh, 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 um, abnormal situations uh, not keen into the periodicity uh, concept but the concept specifically speaks about having an accounting year to assess the business affairs of any business entity the next concept is realization the concept establishes the role for periodic recognition of uh, revenue as soon as a as soon as it is capable of objective measurement i.e if you can objectively measure this revenue you go ahead and uh, record it in books of account and number two the value of the asset received or receivable in exchange is uh, reasonable certain so if you are able to uh, objectively measure it and the, the value to be received or the value that you have received uh, can be ascertained uh, then you can go ahead and re re recognize uh, such a, a revenue in books of account it is possible to recognize revenue at a variety of points for example when the goods are produced you can um, uh, recognize it in your books of account that yes such goods are automatically equivalent to sales that have been made and you recognize them or when goods are delivered you may have you may wait until the goods are delivered to your customers then you go ahead and recognize them i.e record them in the books of account by acknowledging that yes sales have been made or when transaction is uh, com completed uh, by this it means goods have been delivered amounts have been paid transaction completed then you go ahead and recognize such um, uh, revenue in your books of account the choice among these uh, three options that we have identified is in most cases an industrial norm i.e depends on the industry you find yourself and what is the practice in that uh, industry what is important is that these various points are available for businesses to actually uh, uh, consider in recognizing uh, revenue in their books of account the next one is matching concept 
the concept holds that for any accounting period, the earned revenue and all incurred costs that, that are generated that, that generated the revenue must be matched and reported for that uh, uh, period. What that means is that uh, it is believed that for you to have revenue, you must have incurred a particular cost. And because of that, you are to match the revenue generated with the cost that was incurred to generate uh, such um, uh, 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 revenue. Let me give myself, let me use myself as an example. I work in the university. For me to earn salary, I must incur certain costs. For instance, the cost of traveling myself, sorry, the cost of um, uh, uh, leaving my house down to the university in terms of uh, transport cost. What I will is between the time I go to school and the time I will leave. They are all part of the cost that I, as a staff, I as a staff incur before I'm eligible to have a salary. So if, if for the purpose of assessing whether I'm doing well, in terms of uh, revenue generation, it is expected that I compare how much I spend to be able to come to the university and teach with how much I'm being paid. It, it, it is possible that I have other sources of uh, income, but in, in, in matching concept recognize that such a, uh, uh, you only match cost uh, with revenues that such costs were actually incurred to be able to generate to them. If revenue is carried over from a prior period, i.e. from a previous period, or it is deferred to a future period, all elements of uh, cost and expenses relating to that particular revenue are usually carried over or they are deferred as the case may be. The next concept is money measurement and concept. This concept holds that accounting is only concerned with those facts that can be measured in monetary terms. With a fair degree of uh, objectivity in other words accounting is a measurement and communication process of activities of a firm that are measurable in monetary uh, terms uh, what we are saying here is that the basis of measurement uh, should basically be the units the monetary units of in a particular economy that an accountant find himself or herself in nigeria for instance it is naira and kogo that we use uh, as basis for, for, for measurement and reporting uh, financial transactions. If you're in the United States, it is, um, um, what do you call it, uh, dollars and uh, cents. If it is, um, the, 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 if you're in Ghana, it is um, cities and uh, pesos, as the case may be. The next concept is accrual concept. In accounting, the income accruing to a business concern is not necessarily the amount of uh, cash actually received in a period of uh, account, i.e. in, in accounting uh, a period. Similarly, expenses incurred are not necessarily the amount of uh, cash paid in a period of uh, account. Given these uh, facts, the net profit of a firm is the difference between revenue and expenses rather than uh, cash receipts and then cash uh, uh, payments. Now, what determines whether income is accrued or expenses are um, income is earned or expenses uh, are incurred is not just the cash that you have received or the the cash that you have actually paid. There are cash that you receive that you are yet to render a service service for. What determines whether uh, an income is uh, earned or accrued is whether services have been rendered. So for you to say that you have actually earned an income and that income is accrued to you, you must have rendered a particular service. For you to say that yes, and expenses have been uh, incurred, it means you have probably enjoyed a particular service. Now let, let us um, differentiate these uh, two. Let me give a simple example. Uh, you have instances where uh, you have landlords that will tell you if you are to stay in my house or you are to use a particular warehouse, you are going to pay for two years uh, rent. Now, if you pay for the two years uh, rent to the landlord, he has received a uh, cash. To you, you have given out uh, cash. But can we say? that the cash so given 
and the cash so received by the landlord constitutes income and ex income on the part of uh, the landlord and expenses on the part of uh, the person that is renting the facility not 100 percent let's explain that now it is believed that for you to say that yes income has been earned from the point of view of uh, the landlord it is only the amount for the rent that covers the first year that, be, that can be considered as a uh, income that has uh, accrued to the landlord reason being that as a tenant you can appear before the landlord and tell him that sorry by the end of this year i may not stay in your house next i may not be using the facility next year and because of that he is at he is uh, obliged to refund them um, um, the, the money for uh, the subsequent year that you will probably not um, uh, use his um, uh, facility. Now there, there are a number of options. Either he refund um, your cash, or you get another tenant who will use, or he gets another tenant who will use the place, and then the person gives you your money. In which case, you can see that there is a refund of money, uh, which uh, doesn't uh, translate to to income for expenses on your own part. You only incur expenses if you have benefited or enjoyed a particular uh, service. If you have given money to your landlord for two years, what will constitute expense in the current year is the rent for this year. The one that is meant for next year is like an advance payment that you have made that at any time you can approach the landlord and say, let me have my money back. This concept is pronounced, is more pronounced in the private sector as opposed to the public sector where cash basis is um, mostly used. But even in recent time, in the public sector, they have actually uh, found themselves um, engaging in um, accrual based um, accounting. And um, that tells us the superiority of these uh, accrual concepts over the cash uh, basis of uh, accounting. Duality. This is a concept that is based on the assumption that there are two parts to any economic event. Because of that, in accounting, every transaction has a two aspects, and both are recorded in the accounts to present the two ways in which the event affects the transaction. In simple term, in every transaction, we believe there is the receiving side and there is the giving side. For example, if a company sells an item of goods to a customer for cash, the two aspects of these events are delivering the goods, and because of that it will reduce the assets of the business, i.e. the stock, receiving cash from the customer, by this sense it will increase another asset which is a, a cash. So for each transaction, if you are to go by this concept, uh, each transaction has uh, two forms, i.e. two faces, the receiving face and the giving uh, uh, face. In fact, it is this concept that um, gives birth to the debit and the credit um, uh, rule. For every debit, there must be a corresponding credit, and for every credit, there must be a corresponding uh, debit. Meaning, for every receiving, there is giving, and for every giving, there must be uh, receiving. It, 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 this idea can be traced to the work of uh, Luca Pascioli way back in 1494 uh, and a Franciscan monk who actually came up with the idea of uh, the double entry uh, principle. Now we have just talked about uh, um, some of the key uh, concepts. We will now look at uh, conventions. Accounting conventions are rules that are put in place to ensure uniformity in the application of the concepts that we have earlier identified that if you pick historical costs for example uh, conventions should be able to ensure that accountants apply the historical cost uniformly so let us identify the various uh, conventions that we have yeah, in accounting number one we have what we call the substance and um, substance of our form uh, these uh, states that business transactions are accounted for and presented in accordance with their substance and financial reality and not merely their legal um, uh, form 
here we acknowledge the fact that uh, businesses don't operate in a vacuum they operate within the provisions of uh, the law however in recording transactions we give much more emphasis on financial reality even though we are not ignoring the legal form of uh, uh, the transactions they are also very important however we look at uh, financial uh, reality uh, we look at the substance of the transaction not just in addition to the legal form we go ahead and look at the substance as well as the financial reality of the such a transaction one example i will give in this regard is the issue of um, um, higher purchase if you engage in a transaction under higher purchase the legal requirement is that the asset that you bought through that, that you that you probably engage uh, in a contract of a higher purchase is not yet your own until you have finished paying all the installments and you made you paid a token for exercising the right to acquire that asset until that happens that asset is not yet your own but the business the, the financial reality or the substance of the transaction is that number one that asset has will be with you and you use it to generate revenue number two the fact that it is always with you you utilize it to generate revenue like every other assets that you have in the business organization most importantly the major purpose for which you engage in the higher purchase to be able to get that asset is to acquire the assets not just to utilize it and uh, probably refuse to pay the remaining uh, payment now with that in mind it means while the law is saying it is not a year to your own but the substance of financial reality is that it is always with you you use it to generate revenue so going by the law provisions of the law ordinarily because it is not your own you cannot record it in your books of account technically but the substance of financial reality is that you use this asset to generate an income and because of that it is important that you recognize it the recognition for it is that you focus on the cash component of the installments that you have paid you acknowledge that component in books of account you record it and give it the required uh, treatment by the time you take financial accounting probably in second semester details on how to account for higher, higher purchase transactions will be x-rayed by um, the course uh, lecturer that will be taking you uh, such a course the next uh, convention is objectivity this principle connotes independence of judgment on the part of the account on the accountant on the part of the accountant preparing the financial uh, statements recall that the nature of accounting is to provide information to various users for decision making so we're saying this this uh, convention is saying that look as an accountant while preparing financial statements we made available to various users you are expected to exercise independence of judgment objectivity here requires that whatever you are presenting should be supported by verifiable evidence as against subjectivity or dependence on uh, unverifiable opinion of uh, an accountant preparing the financial statement next is fairness fairness is an extension of uh, the objectivity principle for the fact that there are many users of accounting information all having that different um, information need the fairness principle requires that accounting reports should be prepared not to favor any group or segment of the society i.e it should be prepared without bias the next one is materiality this principle holds that only items that are of material value are accorded strict accounting uh, uh, treatment now how do we know whether an item is of uh, material value and then we'll go ahead and give it the strict accounting treatment it deserves and an item is considered to have to to be of um, material value if its misstatement or omission affects decision taken on the accounts in this sense 
the materiality of an item depends on um, the size i.e. or the amount of the item and the organization uh, involved. Let me elaborate on this uh, point. We can see that an item is uh, material. If, for instance, if you don't state it correctly or you omit it completely, it will affect the decision that somebody will take on the basis of that information so provided. Example, in a financial statement where you are supposed to report a profit of, um, let, let's say, a sales of 1 million naira, and out of mistake, you added uh, uh, two zeros. So, instead of having 1 million, you end up having uh, 100 million naira as profit. Of course, any investor that sees that it, uh, sees a business reporting uh, 100 million, sorry, uh, sales, 100 million sales is a good amount. However, if for instance the investor now realizes that the amount is not actually 100 million, it is just uh, 1 million, and because it is just 1 million, he or she changed his decision to probably engage or invest in that time. Uh, Organization. That, that that item becomes an immaterial item. Or it is a case where a particular amount that is supposed to be reported is completely omitted. And if that omission will affect a decision taken on the basis of such report provided, then that uh, item is uh, material in, uh, in, in, in nature. In most cases, uh, where this comes up is where you have... Um, uh, assets. If you have an asset, for instance, the accounting treatment for asset is that for assets you need to uh, depreciate assets year in, year out. Because recall, we mentioned under historical uh, cost that assets are supposed to be recorded using their historical uh, cost uh, values. But as you put the asset to use to generate more revenue, uh, it is expected that you depreciate these assets for two or more reasons. Number one, as you put assets to use, the value of that asset uh, depreciates. Number two, as you put assets to use, you use the asset to generate income. And because of that, a fair part of the cost of the asset should be matched. Remember, we talked about matching concepts. You use an asset to generate income, and that asset has a cost. So in compliance with matching concepts, you're supposed to get a fair portion of that asset that relates to that um, particular year and charge it against the income the asset has um, been able to generate. That fair part of the cost of the asset that is uh, um, match against the revenue of a particular year is classified or known as a depreciation. And by providing for depreciation, we are acknowledging the fact that as you put an asset to use, the value of that asset keeps uh, depreciating over time. Now, there are instances where you have a group of assets that you purchase or a particular asset that you purchase, the value is uh, very small. For instance, if you have um, a large organization that buys um, small tools, and the value of these tools put together is just uh, 5,000 Naira. And this is an organization that probably generates millions of uh, profit. Now, by accounting treatment, what it means is that you have to report that 5,000 Naira in your books of account as a value of the assets, particularly in your statement of, fin statement of financial position and your balance sheet. And each year, you have to depreciate that 5,000 Naira i.e. the value of, depreciate the value of the assets i.e. set aside certain portion of the 5,000 Naira and charge against your uh, profit now the effort in doing that is much more than the benefits of even doing that reason being that the size the organization is a very large organization if you have an organization that uh, probably operates in millions and make uh, millions of uh, profit if you charge the whole of the 5,000 in just one year, instead of spreading the 5,000 across four or five years that such a tools may be in use, 
if you charge the whole of the 5,000 in just one year, the organization can still declare profit. And because of that, that 5,000 or that item is what? Immaterial because if you omit it, if you don't give it strict accounting to it, strict accounting treatment, the business will still make um, the required um, uh, profit. So it will not affect any decision that is taken on the basis of uh, that particular account. So we're saying that in accounting, it is only items that are of material uh, values or material in nature that should be given strict accounting uh, treatment. So if you have items that are not uh, material in nature, you should not uh, emphasize that you must give them a strict accounting uh, treatment. The next uh, convention is a uh, prudence. This principle demands exercising great care in the recognition of profit while all known losses are adequately provided for. Uh, here, the understanding we have is that if you anticipate profit, no matter how likely such profit is in accounting, on the basis of this convention, we say do not recognize such profit until you have actually uh, earned them. Uh, for, for losses, once you anticipate a loss, it is encouraged that you immediately uh, recognize and uh, record uh, such uh, losses. That's why in accounting, this concept provides explanation as to why in accounting we make provision for depreciation, we make provision for um, uh, uh, discounts uh, because these are losses. If you take if you take depreciation, depreciation is an indication that the asset is losing certain values of um, um, the total cost that you actually incurred. So if you anticipate that yes, the, the, the asset is going to lose its value, it is important that you recognize uh, such item in uh, your books of account. It is important to say that the fact that we said if you anticipate um, a profit, you shouldn't uh, recognize almost immediately, but if you anticipate loss, you should provide for it adequately. It doesn't provide a justification for the creation of a secret or hidden reserves. That is not uh, the principle behind uh, having this uh, prudence uh, convention. The next convention is uh, consistency. Usually, there is more than one way in which an item may be treated in uh, books of uh, account without violating accounting uh, principles. However, the consistency uh, principle holds that when a company selects or a business concern selects a method, it should continue to use the method in subsequent accounting periods so that a comparison of accounting figures over time is uh, meaningful. Now this continuity should be done unless there are conditions that call for a particular uh, change. It requires that the accounting treatment of like items uh, is uh, consistent taking one accounting period with uh, another. One example we mostly give in this area is the case of um, um, stock valuation. In stock valuation, there are different methods of valuing stock. For instance, you have the last in, first out, you have the first in, first out. Uh, last in, first out is LIFO. First in, first out is, is first out is a uh, FIFO. We have the average um, pricing method. We have the weighted average pricing uh, method. Uh, we have other methods, uh, we, we, replacement cost methods that you can actually use in valuing your stock. So what this consistency is saying is that while all these options are available for you to value your stock, it is important that if you have adopted a particular method, you should continue to use uh, such a, a method. The reason behind it is that it makes it meaningful and easier to compare accounting figures year in, year out. In place of using LIFO this, this year, in the subsequent accounting year, you use FIFO. In the subsequent accounting year, you use another method. Comparison of um, accounting figures over this period will not make any uh, sense. Another example is uh, depreciation. There are different methods of uh, depreciation, providing depreciation for assets. We have the, light, the, the, the straight line method, we have the sums of year digit method, we have the reducing balance method, we have the produ production unit method, we have the machine hour method. These are various methods that uh, by accounting standards, are, they are allowed to be used in valuing uh, uh, 
uh, sort of providing for the position of your assets. However, what consistency convention is saying is that once you have adopted a particular method, you should apply it year in, year out. It doesn't just stop there. It says that if you have items that are similar, they should be given uh, similar accounts and uh, treatment so that you can easily compare uh, these um, um, figures over uh, time and um, in comparison with uh, one another. Now, these are the, 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 the concepts and conventions put together, uh, considered as uh, principles of uh, accounting that govern accounting uh, practice. Now, it is important that we look at accounting standards on the uh, accounting basis and accounting uh, policies, and then we'll close our cutting until uh, the next uh, discussion. For accounting standards, uh, we, are, we, we refer to accounting standard as a statement that is normally issued by the appropriate standard setting body locally or internationally on a specific area of topic in accounting and which is to be complied with when preparing financial um, uh, statements. Here in Nigeria, I told us earlier, we have keyed into the international financial um, reporting uh, uh, standards and it is expected that um, all companies prepare their financial reports in line with the provisions of the international financial reporting uh, standards. Accounting basis. These are the various methods of uh, applying accounting concepts that have been uh, developed in practice, e.g. methods of uh, stock valuation, methods of uh, depreciation. This can, can be considered as accounting basis. In another sense, we can see accounting basis as a method of recognizing revenue and expenses. Recall earlier I told us we have the cash basis, which is mostly applied in private sector, in public sector, sorry, and then the accrual basis, which is uh, mostly applied in uh, in the private uh, sector. But like I said earlier, even in the private public sector, um, um, you know, uh, careful um, um, movements are towards the accrual basis than the cash basis because of the advantages that are, uh, are there in using the accrual basis. Then we have what we call the accounting policies. <clears throat> These are the specific accounting basis that have been chosen and applied by an accounting entity in preparing its financial statements. Uh, it is expected that these are uh, those um, um, basis that best suit the particular circumstance of uh, such a uh, company as uh, the case may be or such an uh, organization. In many countries, including uh, Nigeria, uh, accounting policies must be disclosed by entities in their annual financial reports in order to assist readers to understand and interpret uh, the financial statements uh, uh, properly. Now, these, it is important that we have this at the back of our minds that in addition to the concepts and conventions, we have standards, we have basis, and then we have um, accounting um, uh, policies. That these are um, issues that must be born in mind if you are to practice accounting or um, go through what accounting uh, reports are. Uh, you should be able to understand the principles or the basis behind um, the pre provision of accounts that are made available to users for various uh, decision uh, making. Uh, my dear students, uh, this is the end of uh, today's um, uh, discussion. In the subsequent discussion will take uh, other issues as stipulated on the course outline that we made available uh, in the previous um, um, discussion. Uh, once again, the window is open for comments, for questions, for clarifications. If there are, we'll drop them on our elements. Please, you can kindly drop such on our elements uh, platform. We'll respond to you immediately. But uh, still, by the time we meet in physical class, we should have um, these uh, issues uh, come up so that we can address them almost I immediately thank you and you have a wonderful um, day thank you